Welcome to another edition of Crosstalk. This is the 6th Plymouth District edition, featuring none other than State Representative Josh Cutler, who represents Hanson, Duxbury, and Pembroke. Welcome, uh, welcome back. Great for to your be back. I, I brought a friend along. <laughs> I see that. Now, talk to me about uh, what, what are we doing today? You have State Treasurer Steve Grossman, who is also a gubernatorial candidate. Sir, welcome to... Delighted, Josh's show. <laughs> delighted to see you again. <laughs> Great well, so to see so, you. So, Kevin, yeah, I wanted to uh, thank you so much for hosting us again. Um, I'm pleased to bring a good friend, uh, State Treasurer Steve Grossman, who's running for governor. Mm. And today we're bringing Steve around. Um, Steve's a very familiar face here on the South Shore, but we're having a, sort of a South Shore day. And Steve was kind enough to lend some of his time. So I wanted to have him come on the show, talk a little bit about his, uh, what he's done as our treasurer, what he hopes to do as our governor. He's a, um, I'm a st strong believer in Steve, and I think he'll make a tremendous governor, and I uh, wanted to give him a chance to talk to our viewers and share his, uh, his vision. So thank you, Steve. Welcome to Cross Talk. I, can I be the co-host, Kevin, with you, kind of? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. it's, it's kind of your show. That's why okay. we, we put your name in there. The sixth <laughs> That's why we have the State House in the backdrop yes. of Cross Talk. All right, Talk. excellent. Well, let's, uh, Steve? Delighted to be here. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> First and, first and foremost, talk to me about being here on the South Shore, you know, being here for South Shore Day and having a chance to kind of see another part of the state. I know you've probably been, since you've kicked off your campaign, been touring the 351 communities that uh, you will look for votes from and that you have been working for as treasurer for the past four years. Well, I'm on the South Shore a lot for a whole variety of reasons. Yep. I'm chairman of the Massachusetts School Building Authority. We spend about a billion dollars a year building and renovating schools. Uh, for those who don't know it, about 10 years ago the legislature decided to take one penny of the sales tax and set it aside in a fund to build and renovate public schools. They knew it needed to be done in a more professional way and a way that protected taxpayer dollars. So as a result of that we're, we finished the Hanover High School some time ago, named the auditorium for the late Bob Nyman. We're going to be dedicating the new uh, Marshfield High School sometime later this uh, fall, sometime in August. Uh, we're doing a lot of work, middle school in Hingham, so schools are an important part of everything we do, including in this area as well. In addition, um, I was down on Monday uh, at South Shore of Oak Tech School because I wanted to see what was going on at the South Shore of Oak Tech School. I know a lot of kids from uh, these two yeah, communities. Whitman and Hanson attend South Shore Vogue Tech, mm -hmm. and I love Vogue Tech schools. I have a huge commitment to them and a desire when I become governor to dramatically increase our investment in Vogue Tech schools. If we really want to build a new manufacturing, a 21st century manufacturing economy and create 50,000 new advanced and precision manufacturing jobs, the Vogue Tech schools and the education our kids get are going to be central to all that. And I'd be happy to tell you some of the things I saw when I was at South Shore Vogue Tech over in Hanover just the other day. I, I, well, I have to ask you, and, and Josh, if you want to chime in, how important is it that you have a, a business background, a guy who is looking to be the next governor, the next person who is elected, how important is it that they understand business and how it works and how to stimulate growth within the job market compared to you know, uh, putting more fees and more taxes and, and things that aren't going to help job growth? I think it's very important. When I ran for treasurer back in 2009 and 2010, worst days of the recession. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of small business roundtables and because I had run a successful fourth generation family business for 35 years, I had a sense as to what it took to create a successful business right. and to grow jobs. So I used to ask one question, I still ask that same question of small business owners. I said, what are the roadblocks and barriers you face in a small business? And how can we in government help remove or lower those roadblocks? And I stopped and listened to the answers. Access to capital, permitting and regulation, lack of technical assistance, mm -hmm. the kinds of things that common sense people understand when they've been in business. Mm -hmm. Access to capital was the biggest issue I heard sure. over and over again. So when I became state treasurer, I asked one question. I said, where are the state's reserve deposits? Our money that is sitting in the bank, and what are we doing with it? I found out that 60% of that money was sitting in banks in Europe, Big Australia, banks. and Asia. And I said, something is wrong with this picture. Yeah. Massachusetts taxpayers' money should be in Massachusetts banks to be loaned to creditworthy small businesses right here in Massachusetts to create jobs. And we poured money into community banks. 54 banks, about $360 right million dollars of our taxpayer dollars 
They've leveraged mm -hmm. and been a catalyst for about 8,000 loans, over $1.3 billion of loans. Mutual Bank right here in Whitman, yeah. Rockland Trust, South Shore Savings Bank, uh, Harbor One, which used to be a credit union, now a bank over in Brockton, and the list goes on and on and on. And some of the loans that we've made have been truly empowering for those small business owners. Fundamental principle, small businesses create jobs. Yep. That's where the jobs come from in Massachusetts, and particularly in the South Shore. That's where the job creation is going to come. If you have a key to what you can do to improve the quality of life for small business owners, reduce regulation, reduce permitting, help reduce the cost of health care, make access to capital more readily available all over the state, you're going to create a lot of jobs and a lot of economic energy. And that's why I'm running. I'm running for governor fundamentally to build one commonwealth that levels the playing field and that leaves no one behind. Okay. Can I, I just I wanted to stress that because that was one of the things that I, I was very excited to learn about when I first uh, uh, got to know Steve, the small business banking program, which you just talked about. To me, it, it's such common sense and um, it, it's, you know, it, it, that it didn't, come, didn't happen until Steve came along. Right. Um, you know, it's a testament to him and his... Um, his uh, administration, but um, it's done it, tr tremendous things here in our district. We've seen, you know, the banks, just uh, Whitman Bank, um, excuse me, Mutual Savings Bank in Whitman. I know um, folks here in Hanson who benefited from that program, so really do appreciate it. I think that sort of speaks to Steve's vision of, you know, running a government that's, that's customer service friendly and, and just using common sense principles to, to, to make government work for everybody. To and solve what problems. had happened, by the way, in 2008 and 2009, we all remember that, is that the biggest banks in America had really reduced their lending. Yeah, yeah. If you, lock, if you talk to the bankers, They'll tell you that the biggest banks in America cut their lending in Massachusetts by a billion dollars in 2008 and 2009. Right. Who stepped in? Community banks, regional banks, right. savings banks. These are the banks that absolutely not only committed to lend money and filled up that pipeline, but think about what the banks do for the local community. Sure. The Little League team needs helmets. Yeah. It's the banks who step right. in and other businesses. If the senior center needs some help, it's banks that step in. So you've got community leaders who live in the local community, who care about the local community, Sorry. and who are building strong, vibrant communities. And fundamentally, the role of government is to strengthen small communities and large communities. It's to give community leaders and community activists the tools and the resources they need in order to grow, develop, and flourish. That's why when the governor uh, decided in his budget to level fund local aid at $921 million, the legislature stepped in and said, Sorry, Governor. Right. That's not right. We need more money back in the local community. And because of Josh's leadership and that of others, increase the funding by $25 million up to $946 million. That extra $25 million is going to have a huge impact on every community for first responders, firefighters, police officers, senior centers, all the things that improve quality of life in every town of the Commonwealth, including these two. Well, and especially in both where we serve Whitman and Hanson, uh, when you're talking about local aid, if you're talking about monies that, especially you get a shared school district, the biggest thing that we've heard over the past couple of years is, is be, having enough money to be able to fund the annual assessment for the school district. Not to mention being your school choice, being able where South Shore Votech is, is a, school, a great school that a lot of the students from Whitman and Hanson, and I believe six other communities yep. go to. Um, it's, it's essential that, that they have that money to be able to pay the annual assessment instead of squabble over, well, we can't afford that. Can you make cuts? So I think that's fantastic. But just in case anybody watching says, gee, are we getting good value for the money that we're putting into South Shore Votech? When I went to the graphic design studio, when I went into the graphic communications program, and I talked to some of the kids who are going to be graduating, most of them going on to college, a couple going into the workforce, the excitement, the energy that I saw these kids are getting a phenomenal education, whether it's sheet metal working, automotive repair, machine tools, or graphic communications. They are getting a great education. Getting a head start. They're learning English, they're learning history, <clears throat> they're learning math, and they're learning something that they can take with them for the rest of their lives. That is a big deal. I'm a huge believer in Voctech education. You will see me as governor investing more time, energy, and money into our Voctech schools and to making sure the equipment that our kids are learning on is truly 21st century up to speed because that's what the business community is going to need and demand. The business community says, this is what we're going to need. The Voctech leadership and the community college leadership have got to respond. If we can create a partnership between business owners, the Voctech leadership, and the community college leadership, then you've got a partnership yep. for workforce development that can really train the next generation of workers. Yeah, I would echo that, Kevin. I, I hear that as well. You know, 
you know, businesses saying that they have jobs, they're not able to fill them because they don't have the folks with the skills to fill them. The so-called middle skills, you know, good paying jobs, middle wage, middle class jobs you can uh, raise a family on. And, um, you know, the community colleges are the key and the Votech schools are really the key to that. And so, you know, I think Steve's right on the money here. What about as far as early education? I know we're talking about mm -hmm. high schools, we're talking about college. What about early education? Is there anything that you feel needs to be done or, or looked at when it comes to early education? I think it's time for us to stop talking about universal pre-K and actually doing something about it. There are 30,000 children in Massachusetts, ages three and four, who get up in the morning and they have no place to go. We all know, educators know, that if you're not learning how to read, by the time you finish the third grade, by the time you're eight years old, you can fall behind and never catch up. Right. So if the state of Oklahoma had universal pre-K back in 1998, how can we say we are the number one state in public education in the country based on test scores when we leave 30,000 kids behind? Is it expensive? It is expensive. Can you make a better investment than in the early education of our children, the next generation of workers, citizens? Kevin, these kids are going to be sitting where you're sitting, where I'm sitting, and where Josh is sitting in just a few years. Correct. If we give them the tools, if we teach them reading and math, and how to grow and develop and flourish and develop self-esteem and be committed to community leadership and community development and community building. If those are the skills we want our kids to learn, it's got to start early. Three and four years old is the place to start it. And I'm committed to doing that. Legislature has done some things. They did put some money in the budget, and I'm grateful for that. But I think we really have to take a giant leap forward on universal pre-K education. Universal pre-K Vogue Tech schools, freezing fees and tuitions at our 29 public colleges and universities because our students and their parents are drowning in debt. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the investments that we need to make to really invest in our young people so that we have the talent pipeline filled to fill those great jobs that are being created every single day because of the genius of the small business sector of the economy. It's, it's funny you mention that because <clears throat> it's not too long ago that uh, U.S. Senator um, Elizabeth Warren has been touting that the biggest problem is, is being able to get loans for higher education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is, is that, that the kids aren't, you know, those who want higher education are drowning in debt and they, they get a higher percentage than, than anybody else. Is that something that hopefully you would want to see if you can, you can work in that realm to well, kind of... two separate issues. First of all, one issue is the interest rate that students and their parents are paying on debt. She contends that the government is going to make a large profit on these Yep, loans, she is saying that, yep. And that if we simply reduce the interest rate, it could be hugely important to those kids and to their families. And I think she is right. But second of all, second of all, if you think about the cost of public education and how the tuition has stayed low, but the fees have gone up. up yep. And those fees we've got to flatten out. Because of the legislature's leadership, because the legislature brought funding of our public colleges back to the 50% level in the 2014 budget, that's the year we're in now, in the 2015 budget, which is the year that will start in July, we were able to freeze fees and tuitions. I want to do it for the next four years. Freeze fees and tuitions for the next four years at all of our public colleges and universities. These are things we can do because we're generating more revenue, the economy is doing better, more people are working, we're starting to come out of this recession at an accelerating rate, so let's start to make some investments. And you're that preparing we your workforce to be, to be, exactly. you know, be able to, for the companies that come in here, they'll have the re required skill set in order to be able to fill those jobs. Right. And the thing about you know, our UMass system <clears throat> and our community colleges, the vast majority of these kids are staying in Massachusetts when they're done. So they're, you know, they're going to they're gonna work in our companies, they're going to you know, raise their families here. So it's really an investment in our future. And I can attest to the, uh, the student loans. I'm still paying my check to Sally Mae once a month, so whatever we can do. <laughs> sure. Thank you for keeping up with the payments. Yes. <laughs> What are, some of the, what are some of the other issues that we have in this particular race for governor? And kind of to dovetail into that question, how do you stay within your, your own race as far as looking for the dem Democratic uh, nomination and stay with the other candidates who are in your race and not want to take on, uh, you know, the, the Republicans? I want to be known in this race as the job creator, the person who in business for 35 years created jobs, good jobs, good paying jobs, empowered his workforce, had a successful business, took that leadership into the state treasurer's office and did things that had never really been done before. I mean, I kept every promise that I made when I sat with you in Brockton four years ago 
and I made a promise to put the state's checkbook online so the taxpayers could go yeah. online and see how money's being spent. Mass.gov slash open checkbook. Yeah. They can do that for 85% of our expenditures, and I want to get to 100%. We promise financial education and literacy. We promise to put every contract out to bid. These are taxpayer dollars. Taxpayers are entitled to know that you are going to put things out to bid and save money. We've saved tens of millions of dollars, and then we hope put this whole program together for small businesses, which has been a grand slam. So I've kept every promise I made. In this race for governor, I want to be known as a job creator, but I also want to be known as somebody who has had a track record successfully of running big hunks of government. Because there are some things that have gone wrong in state government mm -hmm. over these last six, eight, ten months. We know what they are. And I think people want a governor who's going to be on top of things, who's going to roll up his sleeves and make things happen and get things done. Common sense solutions. Watch what's going on and give taxpayers a sense that their money is being spent wisely and that we are doing things in a first-rate way. Charlie Baker will come after me because he'll say, I know how to run government. With all due respect, Charlie, I'm going to say, Charlie, my record is treasurer. You take a look at my record as treasurer. Kept every promise I made. That's the track record I'm running on to be the next governor of the state. Do Josh, do you want to have a follow-up question? No, I think, um, you, you know, Steve hit on the nail on the head. I mean, it's about solving problems and, and, and fixing you know, the problems that we have. And I think Steve has a, a track record. I was going to mention the Mass Open Checkbook. Thanks for, for bringing that up. Right, I think it's yep. a tremendous... Uh, tool for the citizens to stay informed about what uh, how their tax dollars are being spent. We appreciate you know, the, your leadership in, in bringing that out. By the way, speaking of tax dollars being spent, I mentioned the Mass School Building Authority. Yeah. The Mass School Building Authority takes this money, and it's never enough money because we have more schools that need to be built and renovated than we have money. So we did something a few years ago. We created the model school program. Uh -huh. We said instead of having every school designed from scratch, which costs money and takes time, we're going to try to build a model school program. The model school that everybody now looks at, and people come from all over the state to take a look at it, is Whitman Hanson. Yep. This school, built in a way that saved taxpayers money and reduced the amount of time, is now looked at as the model. Norwood used it as its model. Norwood School High School doesn't look anything like Whitman Hanson, but it was done on that model. Right. And if you can use that kind of a model wisely and reduce the cost and reduce the time, save a year or more. Norwood was originally going to spend $100 million to build a new high school. They took the Whitman Hanson model. Guess what it cost them to build a new high school? $69 million. They reduced the cost by $30 million to the taxpayers of Norwood and the taxpayers of the state. So I want to thank the people of Whitman and Hanson for having done something that has become a model for the rest of the state. This is a best practice, and you should all be Do we unbelievably get any proud licensing of it. fees from that? No? <laughs> you, get, you get ice cream in my okay. office from ice time to time whenever you come in. You know, I keep ice cream in my freezer, and I serve homemade ice cream all year long. And Josh Cutler does not hesitate to come by when he wants a little candy or a little ice cream. He's one of the most uh, visible people in the treasurer's office. Has a sweet tooth, huh? True or false? True, yes. <laughs> Guilty. It's charged. It's charged. <laughs> well, I, you have to kind of digress back to some of the issues, and you had, you had brought it up during... Uh, answering one of the questions is, is this, covering, this current governor has seen his share of issues. Right now we're looking at the Department of Children and Families. Mm -hmm. It's issues with the leadership. We've seen problems with uh, EBT cards, the probation department. What, if you're elected as governor, what are some of the things that you would like to take a look at or that you would like to do to revamp some of the systems or some of the agencies that are going to be under your power? So I've had a history over the years of running organizations, Correct. Of running businesses, running the Democratic Party nationally, yep. running nonprofits. So I have a sense of what it means to run things. Running things means accountability, top to bottom. The DCF crisis to me was one that cried out for action earlier, frankly. I was asked back on February 25th, mm -hmm. if Olga Roche had submitted her resignation to you and you had been governor, would you have accepted it, yes or no? My answer was unequivocally yes. Why? Because the people had lost confidence in DCF. It's 36,000 children. So there are three fundamental principles of DCF. The safety of every child, accountability top to bottom from the commissioner down to the person who was hired yesterday, and finally reform. We've got to reform it. And one of the things that we've got to recognize is that we've cut our funding by $100 million over the past few years. Social workers are dealing with 20, 22, 23, 24 cases. 
Every social worker I've talked to says, you can't do it. It Doesn't can't work. work. We can't give it the time it needs. So we need to put more resources. The good news is in a supplemental budget, the legislature voted to put some additional money. They've hired 150 new social workers, maybe a few more than that. So they're starting to deal with that issue, more technology. But oversight is critical. When I hired department heads at Treasury, I put people in place. I give them plenty of latitude but I stay on top of them and I watch them carefully. I'm not saying the governor doesn't. I'm simply saying as governor, the people of Massachusetts need to look you in the eye and say, he's watching the store and he's running things in a first-rate way and he's using my taxpayer dollars wisely because I work darn hard for that money and I want that money spent wisely. I don't want it wasted on computer systems for the health care connector that don't work and we need to redo mm -hmm. and it's costing us tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars. That is not acceptable. We have about five minutes left. Well, Kevin, can I jump in? Because we've, we've, we've had some very serious topics that we've been talking about, and, and, and thank you, Steve, for, for uh, bringing them up. But I think it's for, time for a little fun. We talked about ice cream a few minutes ago. I'm ready. And, uh, you know, but we still have five minutes before we get to that, just so you know. Oh, we have five minutes. Well. Before we get to that. So if you have, another, if you have anything that we want to stay on topic, I know there's things going on. I mean, we've got the convention coming up. If you want us to briefly talk about that. Do we not have I was going to bring up ice cream, but I guess we do have time for more serious talk well, for let a me, few let, me bring up trans <laughs> let me bring up transportation. Okay. Because there is nothing that galls people who live on the South Shore more than the amount of time it takes to get, if they happen to work in the Boston area, the rail, yep. home, oh, yeah. back and yep. forth. So we need to make sure that we fully fund the governor's $10 billion transportation package. Again, I give the legislature a lot of credit. They put $600 million on the table. That's a tough vote to take. But they did take the vote because they knew that unless you have a 21st century transportation system, it's not going to work. So what does that mean? It means the South Coast Rail. It means, it means bringing back weekend service on the, on the, on the Plymouth-Kingston yeah. line and right. Greenbush. It means restoring that. It means uh, improving our commuter rail service. It means rebuilding South Station so that it can take more trains coming in from the South more readily. It means regional transit authorities. If we can reduce our carbon footprint, if we can reduce the use of gasoline, continue to promote renewable energy, continue to do energy efficiency. We're number one in the country in energy efficiency. By building, when we build more apartments, multi-family housing, near transportation centers, we can reduce our carbon footprint and create jobs. You know this, there are, in the clean tech industry, there are 80,000 jobs in 5,500 companies, and over the next 10 years, we'll create another 80 to 100,000 jobs. Okay. We want to be the center of the universe for clean tech. Absolutely. And why shouldn't the South Shore be a prime participant and beneficiary of the clean tech jobs. Wind, solar, electric cars, all of these things need to be a part of our future. We can do this. It will be better for quality of life. It will reduce people's cost of living and will certainly make the commute far more attractive than it is now. People are up in arms about this and they should be. Well, we appreciate your support for that. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, um, uh, we have a special event coming up, Hanson Days, coming up in June. And uh, the state treasurer's office is going to be down there for a special role, which is uh, part of uh, the unclaimed mm -hmm. property division. And I thought maybe Steve could just give a quick plug to that for folks who may be listening, who may have some money that they may have uh, forgotten about or, or lost track of that they might be able to reclaim. So I oversee unclaimed property for the state. Last year we returned $103 million to the people of the state. We're holding $2 billion. $2 billion. 600,000 people have unclaimed property. Goodness. One out of every 10 people. I did. <laughs> so what I hope people will take away from this conversation is that if you want to take a look, go on our website, findmassmoney.com. That's findmassmoney.com. Steve, we're getting a little cryon thing there. Well, <laughs> what's, what's, what's the uh, treasurer's uh, website and what is your website for, for running uh, for governor? My website is stevegrossman.com. But I want them to go and findmassmoney.com. I want them to take a look for unclaimed property. If they don't have a computer, they can call 888-344-MASS. We want to return property to them. Insurance proceeds, deposits, payroll checks that you never cashed, a dividend check that never got to you. There are any number of reasons why you would have unclaimed property. No statute of limitations. If your grandmother died 17 years ago and you find a passbook that had $500 in the local bank and you claim it, we'll give you that money 17 years later with interest oh, right up on the time we write the check. <laughs> Better get digging. Findmassmoney.com. Findmassmoney.com. <laughs> well, now, is there anything that we have Okay, so now is, my, is this now my cue to... Now is your cue. All right, cue. now is my cue. I blew my cue earlier, so I don't want to do it Pull twice. Pull the curtain back a little <laughs> bit here, but uh, we're going to do something So we've special. been talking about uh, ice cream a little bit earlier, Stephen. We know you're a big ice cream fan, so we thought we'd sort of take the show on the road and do a little crosstalk 
over at a favorite hangout here in Hanson, which is Heidi's Hollow Ice Cream, and have you a chance to sample some of the great ice cream they got down there. So what do you say we take the show on the road and uh, go check it out? We do meet and greets all over the state. Ice cream is one of the things that... Do you know very many people who aren't smiling when they're eating ice cream? No. I don't. No. I'm always <laughs> smiling. When one of my favorite things, and this time of the year is a perfect time to do it. So let's go to Heidi. All right, let's go. Wow, let's wow. see. Look at all these flavors. Oh boy. Awesome. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm gonna be torn between, what's your I'm gonna be torn today between butter pecan and maple walnut. Okay. I'm always partial to the cookie dough, but you're the ice cream expert, so I'll defer to you. So, All right, well, come on in. You know, uh, Ron, Ron St. Angel is our new town administrator. Hi, Hi. How are you? great to be here. Good Joe O'Sullivan, you know Joe from this I morning. Indeed. I'm a delegate for you. Do indeed. Just... He's a glutton for punishment. I know twice in one day. That's right. Betty, my yeah. precious wife. Hi, Hi Betty. Hi. <laughs> How do you do? Linda Quigley. Steve. Linda Quigley, the owner, owner of this Owner of the shop. You're only owner. Small yeah. business yeah. owner. Yeah. I, I love this place already. Thanks. I mean, I came up, I see those old signs on the side of the building over there. My father was an inveterate collector of old license plates. He uh -huh. loved old license plates. Dad does too. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Jimmy, you again? Our oh, yeah. again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, who, what, what do you guys want yeah. for ice cream? Uh, Ronnie, you know, there you go. My God, one good. No, you don't. You probably get. You got it covered. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, can I get you an ice cream? I got one. I'm sure. You got one? You guys? Yeah. Well, ahead here. All right. So, yeah. just me and Steve. All, all of this stuff. We have IBC, root beer, all the stuff that we all don't find often enough. Right. Now you see all the lights. Oh, I saw them all. Yeah. 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 Make it small. That's what I can make small. Yeah. Jim, what can I get you? No, I don't say. I want to say thank you, <laughs> thank you because yeah, as I understand it, you remade them as we did. All right, Steve. So, what do you think? Awesome. I met the owner. 26 years they've been open. Built it on the side of her house, and it's just a wonderful place. Delicious ice cream, butter pecan. What you have? I had uh, cook, chocolate chip cookie dough. Well, good stuff. All my friends here. I don't <laughs> think it comes. Any, I don't think it comes any better than no, this kind I'm of glad you could, place. Wonderful on a beautiful day. I'm glad you could stop here at Heidi's Hollow in Hanson, and uh, for the sixth Plymouth edition of uh, Crosstalk with Kevin Tachi, I'm Representative Josh Cutler. Thanks for tuning in. In the small town of Elmira, New York, a boy was born into an all-American family. The odds of him opening his own clothing store at the age of 18? One in 138,000. Excited to be a part of pop culture, he packed for the big city. The odds of finding someone to invest in his vision? One in 4.5 million. The odds of him achieving his dream in the fashion industry? One in 23 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 88. I am Tommy Hilfiger, and my family is affected by autism. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Early diagnosis can make a lifetime of difference.